Thank you, Mary. Um, <clears throat> Word of God Speak, that was the name of that offertory. And uh, talking about the theme of the Word of God this morning. As we finish up <clears throat> or get close to putting on all of the armor of God, we've gone through almost every piece. We put on the belt of truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We're holding out the shield of faith. We placed on our heads the helmet of salvation. And today we take up the sword of the spirit, the sword of the spirit. You'll find all of the armor of God in Ephesians 6. And in verse 17, you will see where Paul talks about, mentions, putting on with prayer the sword of the Spirit. Paul says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Which is the Word of God. Now, this of all the armor, as, as most of us can can imagine the figurative speech of Paul, the sword is the offensive part of our armor, isn't it? It's the offensive part of our armor. The, the sword takes us into battle, and we can wield the sword. And so we're to take the sword of the Spirit with us. We're to take it as we go through life. We're to take it as we work for God. We're to take the sword as we witness. We're to take the sword with us as we battle Satan and the evil that he spreads. We're to take the sword when we are tempted. And so what is it about this sword of truth, the Word of God? Let me share with you, I think, three thoughts of Paul and God as he gave these words to Paul and to us about the sword this morning, the sword of the Spirit. First of all, we need to remember that the sword of the Spirit is not ours. But if you read that verse, the sword belongs to who? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The sword is the property of the sword is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, we must be properly trained in how to use the sword, spiritually trained. Now, you can imagine every Roman soldier was trained in detail how to effectively use their sword in battle. And they knew how to use that sword many different ways. In fact, it was said in, in history of the world at that time, the Roman sword was a feared weapon throughout the world because the soldiers could wield it so powerfully. You know, I, I don't know if we have any Marines here. I know, uh, Mike, give me a hoorah there. Thank you. You know, the Marines, I understand everybody's a rifleman. No matter if you're the general or you're a corpsman, or whatever, a chaplain, you're a rifleman. They know how to use that rifle, clean that rifle, bear that rifle, and they know how to use that weapon in every way. The Roman soldier was no different. And it's no wonder, can you imagine how dangerous this weapon of the sword would be in the hands of a person who was not trained, who was not disciplined, who wasn't a soldier in the Roman army? Well, our spiritual sword, the sword of the Spirit, Paul says, is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. And we too, as Christians, as believers, we have got to train, we've got to study, and we have got to practice the Word of God if we want to properly use it as well, don't we? There's a lot of ways we can misuse the word. Can you imagine, just as it was dangerous 
for anyone other than the Roman soldier to go into battle with that physical sword. How dangerous the Word of God is in the hands of a Christian or anyone else who is not trained in the Word, who is not disciplined in the Word, who does not, uh, in truth, share the Word. And we know from Paul's letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that the Spirit and the Word of God go together. Paul says in Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's the Spirit of God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If we study God's Word, if we revere God's Word, if we discipline ourselves in God's Word, then it's profitable. It's profitable in all we do. Our reproof is God-based. Our correction is God-based. Our training others is God-based. And we become complete, equipped for every good work of God. So the property, the sword as the property of the Holy Spirit, reminds us that the spiritual battles of life are the Lord's, and we have the promise of victory through Jesus Christ. Let me take you back to an Old Testament illustration to prove that point. The battle is the Lord's. Remember the story in the book of Judges of Gideon. We have some gentlemen here or who are in the Gideons sharing the word of God. But the story of Gideon is that God calls on Gideon to save the nation of Israel against one of them ites that were always around. These were the Mennonites, not the Mennonites, but the Mennonites. And you remember the story, those maybe that have read and been in Sunday school all your life. Uh, Gideon gathers a big army. He cries out, and all the soldiers, all the men come to be in the army, and God says, you have too many here. And he begins to whittle them down, doesn't he? And he whittles them down, and God says, still have too many. Still have too many against this big nation of the Midianites. So he whittles them down some more, and he, he gets down to just this small group. And God gives Gideon the battle plan, and they surround the encampment of the Midianites late one night, almost near dawn. And they have the Israelite army, which is down to about 300, they have a sword in one hand and a jar in the other. <laughs> and at the command, at the sound, God says, have, every, have everybody break that jar. And they surround the camp, and everybody breaks that jar and makes this loud noise. They throw up a cry of the Lord, and God uses that to confuse the camp of the Mennonites so much that they are in disarray and they even begin battling each other, and they flee and run, and Israel has a great victory. Now, the message of that Old Testament story is, is that it's God who fights and wins the battle. It's not us, isn't it? It's God who is fighting and winning the battle of our lives of our spiritual battles, of our battles with life, of us getting through things in life. And the main weapon that we use is the sword of the Spirit. It's the Spirit sword, but God gives it to us like he gave that little army a sword and a clay jar, and it's enough for us. It's enough for us. Now, one word of caution when it's the sword of the Spirit. Never think and, and misunderstand that the sword 
is your sword. It's the Spirit's sword. It's God's sword. So never use the Word of God as a weapon against others. Against others to hurt them, to harm them, to injure them, to judge them. The Word of the, of the sword of the Spirit, of the Word of God, it's really made to convict you, to shape you, to protect you. It's not a weapon to destroy others. That's not what the Word of God is about. So the second point of what the sword of the Spirit is to be used for is to be used as a defense against the subtle and not so subtle temptations and attacks of Satan. It's to be used that we may resist the temptations and the evil attacks of the evil one. You know, those that have ever been to vacation Bible school or taught in Bible school, and we hold up and we say the pledge to the Bible, we have quoted these, this scripture and we've carried it with us for years and years and years. The psalmist that says, I have hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I have hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119. The knowledge of the word is an offensive weapon we can wield when we're tempted or when we've discovered we've drifted off course from God's will. God's Word can bring us back. God's Word can convict us and bring us to repentance. And God's Word, which is a sword of the Spirit, can bring us to our knees quickly. It's a sharp sword. And the sword of the Roman soldier was very sharp. It was sharpened on both sides. It could slice through flesh, through bone, and even other soldiers of the world armor. It was that dangerous. The Hebrew writer in chapter 4, verse 12 says, God's word is like that. In fact, he uses the image of the sword again, doesn't he? The Bible says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Did you hear that? God's word can pierce to your very heart. It can pierce through all the noise, all the distractions, all the lies, all of your excuses, all of those things of your heart. And that sword can bring you to think and to speak honestly and openly to your God about your intentions, your thoughts, your motives, and confess your sin to the Lord God. The Word of God brings us to repentance. And God hears us and forgives us. What a great weapon to have as we all do our best to live for the glory and in the will of God. We have the sword of the Spirit of the Word of Truth. Now, the greatest example in Scripture of how to use the sword of the Spirit in this way is from our greatest example in life, and that's Jesus and that is Jesus' experience in the wilderness. You remember? Jesus, just beginning his ministry, was just baptized by John, and he is really struggling with what type of Messiah God is calling him to be. And so he flees into the wilderness to fast and to pray. And he's met there by the devil, isn't he? And Satan tempts him. He tempts him to be um, 
an earthly Messiah, an earthly king, one that, that uses uh, lights and flash and, and drama and miracles that don't mean anything to make people believe who he is. And Jesus resists every temptation Satan throws at him. And the way he defeats Satan and the way he doesn't come into temptation and sin is that for everyone, he wields the Word of God, doesn't he? He has a scripture. He has a passage he has taken, hid in his heart, and he did not sin against God. The Spirit illumined his heart and his mind and brought these scripture passages to bear. If you want to please God, if you want to know his will, if, if you want to resist temptation in your life, wield the mighty sword of the Spirit. That's another reason that Paul asked, asked us to put it in his arsenal. Thirdly, the sword of the Spirit gives us the words to say and guides us what to do in tough situations. How many times have you ever found yourself in a conversation where you've had the chance to share your faith? You've had the chance to, to explain Christianity. Uh, you've had a chance to share your testimony. And in those moments, you, you had a sudden fear that came on you. Maybe you felt incompetent. Maybe you weren't sure when you were asked to teach or, or to share your witness. Maybe still you're a little shy to facilitate a small group, to facilitate a prayer group, to, to um, even pray out loud, really, really is a tough thing to do. Paul says the sword of the Spirit is offered to you by God to help you through these moments. The Word of God, as Paul uses it here, is, in fact, the Word of God in the New Testament is never used to denote Holy Scripture. It's not denoted to use written Scripture. Because remember, when these letters and the Gospels are being circulated around these early churches, they are being shared orally, aren't they? They're being read. Or maybe a single letter written is read, but there was no canon or Bible or New Testament. There was an Old Testament, but they couldn't open up their Bibles to the New Testament and read as we do. So the phrase, the Word of God, here in the language, in the Greek, literally means this. It's the Word which God gives us to speak. It's the Word which God gives us to speak. And it reminds us that the Holy Spirit is always with us to give us the words to say, especially when we're witnessing for Him. The Holy Spirit's there to give us the right words to say. Jesus says in Matthew 10 to the group he's sending out, he said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. It's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, that is speaking through you when you share. So Jesus promises no matter how difficult the situation, no how adamant the arguer, 
How great your fear and sense of intimidation is, the Spirit of God will speak through you and witness for Jesus Christ. The sword of the Spirit aids us in overcoming our fears and to be bold witnesses for Jesus. And as with the other armor, the sword allows us to stand firm. We gain confidence, not in ourselves, but in the ever-presence and the power of God that's within us. And the more we claim the Word and cling to the Spirit, we become a planted tree, a, a tree firmly planted. And the very first psalm gives us a beautiful picture of that. The psalm that says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stands in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, for whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. We stand firm. We're planted. We're grounded. We do great things for God. When we rely on the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, based on the Word of God, that's the offensive power of the sword. So I encourage you to go out and freely swing and jab and cut and wield the sword of the Spirit in your life for the glory of God from now on. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for residing in us. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your testimony. May we trust more. May we share more. May we be encouraged more by the Spirit, your Spirit within us. And may we base all of it on your holy word, O oh God. In your name we pray, amen.